Hello, and welcome to Finding the Key to Better Outcomes in FLT3 Mutated AML. I'm Dr. Mark Levis from the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center in Baltimore, and today we're going to explore new evidence that's been published and presented at recent oncology congresses with clear implications for upfront management of patients with FLT3 mutated AML, as well as how we use next generation FLT3 inhibitors. During this activity, I'll focus on evidence presented at the EHA 2023 Congress, but I'll also provide context by sharing cases where I think this evidence could prove useful for treatment decisions. So let's begin. The goals for this activity, we want to enhance your knowledge of current guidelines and updated evidence on capturing FLT3 mutations and the use of next-generation FLT3 inhibitors in AML. We want to equip you with the skills you need to build treatment plans that utilize FLT3 inhibitors in combination with intensive chemotherapy or as maintenance therapy. And we want to prepare you to manage toxicity concerns associated with FLT3 inhibitors in AML. Now, by way of background, FLT3 mutations in AML are nothing new, but I think it's important to focus on the role of the wild type FLT3 receptor. This receptor is a critical signaling molecule in myeloid development, and it promotes the survival and expansion of multipotent progenitor cells. These cells are critical for the recovery of hematopoiesis after chemotherapy-induced aplasia. So if you think about it, if you hit somebody with chemotherapy and induce aplasia, you're relying on the MPP cell, as we call it, to reconstitute the marrow and it relies on FLT3 signaling. So if you're inhibiting FLT3 in that context, you're going to have an impact that you need to watch for. And we know that 25% of AMLs will have a FLT3 IGD mutation clearly associated with a worse prognosis, and about 5-10% have FLT3 TKD mutations, the tyrosine kinase domain, less of an impact on prognosis, but still driver mutations. So let's talk about FLT3 inhibitors two broad categories, type 1, type 2. Type 1 looks like ATP, binds to the active site, and it will inhibit FLT3 wild type, FLT3 ITD, as well as FLT3 TKD mutant receptors. The first generation were older drugs that inhi type 1 inhibitors, and mitostorin is, in fact, a uh, first generation is a type 1 inhibitor. The more specific and potent drugs coming up, giltaritinib and crinolinib, those are type 1 second generation. Type 2 inhibitors bind only to the inactive conformation of the receptor, and so they cannot bind to, for reasons I'm not going to really go into, a FLT3 TKD mutated receptor. So the first generation is serafinib, and there were others, panatinib and tendutinib. The second generation that's coming out uh, for widespread use soon is quizartinib, very specific and potent second-generation type 2 inhibitor, specific for FLT3 IDD, not for TKD. So the current guidelines, if a patient comes in with AML and is eligible for intensive induction and they have a FLT3 IDD or TKD mutation, they'd get standard 7 plus 3 plus mitostorin. That type 1 inhibitor inhibits both those mutations. If they're ineligible for intensive induction with that same scenario, Category 1 recommendation is azavent. You all know that. You can do, of course, decidabine vent if that's your preference. In some circumstances, NCCN recommends giltaritinib by itself or with azacitidine, and I might consider that in certain circumstances. But for the most part, azavent is what people are going to use. But in the relapsed refractory setting, after you have repeated, and this is important, repeated the genomic profiling, Patients with, an, uh, with AML with a FLT3 ITD or TKD mutation, giltaritinib is usually your first choice. Eight years ago, seven years ago, when mitostorin was coming out, we, we had a big problem. People were not testing routinely for these FLT3 mutations at diagnosis. And while that has gotten better, it still isn't 100%. We're still seeing some occasional cases where at diagnosis, you're not checking for those FLT3 mutations. And there's this very mysterious new thing, next generation sequencing, 
is coming out. How, what do you, how do you use that? Finally, we've got lots of new inhibitors coming out. We have Vitastorin, but Quisartinib looks like it's coming out very soon and Giltritin is approved already in certain circumstances. And is there a role? How do we use these? And what's the role potentially for maintenance therapy with these drugs? So with that background and those questions, now I'm going to provide you with some updates on these next generation FLT3 inhibitors that have been presented at the recent oncology meetings. We'll start with quizartinib and quantum first. This is a study, a phase three randomized study of, for patients with newly diagnosed AML. Remember, quizartinib is active against FLT3 IGD mutations. It's a type two inhibitor. So these patients had to have a FLT3 IGD AML, newly diagnosed, and they were randomized. Everybody received seven plus three induction, and then they received either quizartinib or placebo in kind of a standard eight, day eight to 21 of induction. They then could also receive, they could receive one or two cycles of induction, kind of per our standard approach. Consolidation consisting of hydrocytarabine with quizartinib, again, kind of in that same pattern that we use mitostorin per the ratified trial. Again, randomized placebo versus quizartinib all the way through and could continue with either allogeneic transplant and get quizartinib as continuation therapy afterwards, or they could get continuation therapy with quizartinib regardless if they simply completed their consolidation. So that's the structure of quantum first. You might ask, how did this occur when mitostorin was approved? Well, this trial started before the approval of mitostorin in the U.S., and before the approval of mitostorin in general throughout the world. So this trial actually accrued worldwide, globally, like any of these trials do, and accrued in places where mitostorin was not available, initially in the U.S. and then elsewhere. This is the general consort diagram, 268 patients in the quizartinib arm, 271 in the placebo arm, after screening, in their entering induction phase, and uh, a fraction, of course, large fraction entered in each arm, entered consolidation phase and continuation phase. And here's a breakdown of the patients, median age of around 55. More than half in general were NPM1 mutated, which is what we expect. Of importance in this study, unlike Ratify, which was the Mitostorin study, this study allowed patients up to age 75. The Ratify study, which got Mitostorin approved, only went up to age 59. This really was a broader array of patients. Now, here's the primary endpoint, overall survival, and patients in the quizartinib arm clearly had an improved overall survival, 22.4% reduction in risk of death, hazard ratio 0.776 with a p-value two-sided to 0.03. Okay, so quizartinib wins over placebo, and you say, well, how do you use this in the context of mitostorin? Well, we would point out the ratified trial, which was the mitostorin trial, accrued almost a quarter of the patients with FLT3 TKD mutations, which have a better outcome. This is a rougher crowd, shall we, if you want to say. This is a, they're older and they have the worst mutation. And the outcomes are really quite striking here. So we're going to have to start making decisions on these newly diagnosed patients, what to do with them when we have this tool available to us. Now, Again, focusing on inhibition of wild-type FLT3 in that multipotent progenitor cell, again, we did see neutropenia more so in the quizartinib arm compared to the placebo arm at kind of all levels of treatment. Uh, in general, this could be managed, and you, you saw the result in overall survival. It was better, but again, it's something to really draw attention to that theme, and that theme is going to, we're going to come back to that theme later in this talk. Patients with FLT3 IGD AML are routinely taken to allogeneic transplant when feasible. And many regulatory authorities, many clinicians question, well, maybe it was all the benefit of transplant. Well, we did an analysis of the quantum first data, looking very specifically at allo transplant as a time dependent variable, meaning if you're alive long enough to go to transplant, you're, of course, you're going to do better. And so you have to take that into account in your multivariable analysis. And this data shown here basically says, no, it doesn't matter. Even with that analysis, quizartinib was better. Now, importantly, in patients on this trial, if 
they went to allo transplant in first remission, they clearly did better. So it both supports that quasartinib independently confers a survival benefit from transplant, but that allo transplant remains a, a, an appropriate thing to try and do for your patient to maximize their benefit. And now looking at this data in the form of our more familiar Kaplan-Meier curves, these are Kaplan-Meier curves of patients who on quantum first were either going to transplant or not on either the quasartinib arm or the placebo arm. And I want to draw your attention to the solid blue and the solid green lines. Those are really the interesting points here. The patients who did the best were on the quasartinib arm and went to transplant in first remission. And we saw this in the Ratify trial. And the immediate speculation was that, well, patients had two reasons for being doing better on this arm. One, they probably had a deeper remission. That would be reflected in what's called measurable residual disease, MRD. If you could get MRD data on these patients, we would predict that they would have a deeper remission than the patients on the placebo arm. It's also possible that benefit was conferred by post-transplant continuation therapy with quisartinib. Both could be at play, and we're going to continue on those themes in the next several minutes. So looking at MRD, how do we address MRD in this trial? Well, it turns out we were very much focused on MRD and quantum first. We specifically developed an assay to look at MRD in these patients. Now, patients in a morphologic complete remission by the conventional PCR method of analyzing FLT3 mutations, you can you don't know how deep that remission is. In general, if you have a leukemic burden of under 1% of the total cellularity there, you're not going to see it with standard approaches, including the standard PCR for FLT3 ITD mutations. You will not detect them that way. So this assay is a combination assay of PCR combined with next generation sequencing. You can't get this assay simply by ordering your conventional NGS as you're used to doing. This is a specialized assay developed specifically for FLT3 ITD mutations. We PCR up the region uh, encoding for the FLT3 ITD mutation itself in the Juxta membrane region. And then we analyze the amplicons with next generation sequencing. And we can get down to a lower limit of detection of two times 10 to the minus six two cells out of a million. Very sensitive. The lower limit of quantification, now, is it linear, meaning how accurately can we quantify it? That gets down to about 10 to the minus 4. But we are clearly seeing these mutations even lower than that. So let's see what this assay does when we look at the quantum-first population. Our hypothesis was that reducing or clearing this MRD would be associated with longer survival and that the addition of quisartinib to induction therapy would be associated with a lower level of MRD compared to placebo, thus conferring the survival benefit in transplant. And so we had genomic DNA isolated from these bone marrow aspirates, and the large majority, as you, as you can see, 99.4%, most of them were aspirates, and, and some were peripheral blood. Um, and the FLT3 ITD mutations that we detected in the MRD assay we confirm were the same ITD that was seen at diagnosis. So this, the specificity of this assay is very nice. The, the specific length of the ITD confers a, a specificity to this assay. And we calculated variant allele frequencies above or below 10 to the minus 4. So here are the data. This is the variant allele frequencies, call it the burden of the FLT3 ITD mutation in the remission marrow at the end of induction. And each little dot is a patient. And shown on the left is a logarithmic scale. So the lower the dot, uh, the deeper the remission. And in fact, these ones down here, we couldn't detect it. So they, we had dropped the ITD down below the level of detection. And you can actually see in the quisartinib arm on the left, the, the sort of blue-purple box, those had a higher incidence of undetectability. And the median level of MRD in the quisartinib arm was threefold less than the placebo arm. That's just after induction, and that was a nominal p-value of 0.025. So yes, that hypothesis that the addition of quisartinib lowers the MRD level is confirmed after induction. 
Now, uh, this is the level, this, this red dotted line is the 10 to the minus four. Above that, patients have a pretty high burden of disease bordering on our ability to detect it even with the PCR assay. So first of all, what does it mean having MRD at that level? So here is an overall survival curve, irrespective of treatment arm. This is all patients on quantum first, not paying attention to whether they got guzartinib or placebo. Having MRD, the green line, confers a worse survival uh, effect. In other words, you're better off if you're MRD negative. Okay, that just validates this assay as predicting survival. Okay. But what, is it hap what happens when you break it up by treatment arm? And that's shown here. So here is looking at patients who are undergoing allotransplant. So everybody's in remission after either getting chemotherapy plus placebo or chemotherapy plus um, quizartinib. And on the left are patients who are MRD negative. And by that, we're saying they are uh, using a cutoff of that 10 to the minus 4, pretty high cutoff. You can see, actually, there's only a slight benefit to quizartinib post-transplant. There is a benefit. The big benefit comes in the MRD-positive patients shown over on the right. Now, this is a post-hoc analysis, so this was not pre-specified. A little bit later, I'm going to tell you a pre-specified study with Giltrid. But with the quizartinib, it's coming out as expected. The MRD-positive patients are the ones that really benefit from the quizartinib arm, from being in the quizartinib arm. And here is it. They get a deeper remission, but after allotransplant, if they're MRD positive, being on the quizartinib arm really helps them because in all probability, they're getting maintenance therapy, continuation therapy with quizartinib. But the quantum first study was not designed to answer this specific question. It was designed to answer benefit with induction consolidation and overall. We'll get to the post-transplant question in a minute. But Summarizing what we learned from quantum first, that the addition of quizartinib to induction and consolidation confers a survival benefit for patients with newly diagnosed split through agony ML, and that uh, its in addition results in a deeper remission based on that PCR and GSMRD. And patients undergoing allotransplant at first remission who received quizartinib had better pre-transplant had better survival post-transplant. Lower levels of MRD pre-transplant are clearly associated with better survival post-transplant. That's post hoc. That brings us to the next study, which is the Morpho study, BMTCTN1506. So we have these patients who have a FLT3. Now, now different study, newly diagnosed FLT3 ITD AML. And we know that you want to give them a FLT3 inhibitor post-transplant, but which patients should get it? Should it be based on MRD or should it be everybody? So to do that, we took giltritinib, which is a, a, a drug beautifully designed for maintenance. Patients don't have any side effects. It's very well tolerated. It's approved for the relapsed refractory setting. Let's test it in the setting of patients going to allotransplant in remission. Let's randomize them to placebo or giltaritinib and see if there is a benefit. And we will ask, does everybody benefit or is it is MRD really should be used to guide who should get this drug? So this was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled worldwide trial uh, of 16 different countries, 110 centers. The primary endpoint was relapse-free survival with lots of secondary endpoints. And an important one was the effect of pre and post MRD on those uh, on survival with regard to giltaritinib versus placebo. Here's the breakdown. You had to be elite, an adult with a FLT3 IDD mutation in first remission. We didn't take patients who had been salvaged. Everything had to be going well. You registered. Just before you went to transplant, we collected a sample for MRD analysis from the MARA. The patient went to any type of transplant locally, uh, done by their, their local transplant physicians at the centers. After engraftment, we collected yet another sample for MRD analysis, and then the patient was randomized to either giltritinib, 120 milligrams per day, or placebo, and followed for 24 months of that maintenance therapy. And we screened 620, registered 488, and randomized 356 patients like this over a three-year period from August 2017 to March uh, to July 2020 with a very recent data lock. 178 in each arm, 
And you could see in general the breakdown of what happened with these patients. If you were in the gilteritinib arm, the main reason that you might have come off the study treatment was an adverse event, whereas on the placebo arm, it was relapse more commonly. So again, the median age, 53, the largest group of patients were from North America, but it was truly worldwide, Europe and Asia Pacific. 60% had a myeloblative conditioning regimen. And looking at what we got with MRD, 20% of the patients roughly had a fairly high level of MRD, 10 to the minus four or higher. And we actually, that was one of our stratification points, but we could detect MRD either pre or post transplant, but pre randomization in roughly half of the patients on this study. Now, safety tolerability, again, a theme emerges. Yes, there were more drug related, treatment related, uh, treatment emergent adverse effects in the gilteritinib arm. But importantly, the same theme that I talked about with Guzartinum emerged here. The neutrophil count decreased was the big one that we saw on this study. Now, there was also, to some degree, platelet count and anemia, but really what was what emerged was that neutrophil count de decrease, meaning we're hitting that MPP cell, our effect on our uh, potent inhibition of wild type FLIP3, probably affecting the MPP cell when the marrow is trying to recover from this, this uh, in this case, transplant. And furthermore, an interesting thing emerged with this. We noticed that worldwide, there was quite a wide disparity in azole use. Azoles, concomitant azole use, particularly the strong CYP3-4 inhibitors, posaconazole, voriconazole, itraconazole, will elevate the concentration of gilteritinib. By the way, the same thing can happen with quizartinib. So we see that here, there was wide disparity in azole use, higher levels as a result of that, which is going to in turn probably exacerbate that myelosuppression that you see. Here's the primary objective. Technically, we did not meet our pre-specified level of significance at 0.05. It was 0.0518 in relapse-free survival, gilteritinib versus placebo. But we were very interested in the whole MRD question. This actually wasn't that much of a surprise. If you look at the curve there on the left, yes, looks like gilteritinib is better overall. Uh, whether you can argue whether 0.0518 is significant or not, for the purposes of regulatory authorities, yes, it's significant. But remember, we were as interested in the MRD question here. Can we decide who needs this drug? And in subgroup analysis, MRD leaped out as the main predictor for benefit from gilteritinib. And this is the forest plot where we could see that MRD virtually at any level was predicting benefit of gilteritinib. And so let's focus on the MRD in this assay. Again, this is the same two-step assay. This was done with a commercially available one that is available world that's available in North America right now. And it was analyzed. Again, we got very good coverage. 98% basically of patients who were on this study, we had good quality aspirates pre and post transplant. 46% of patients had detectable MRD pre-transplant, and an additional 19.9%, 20% were detectable post, including a few, 4.5%, who had been undetectable pre, but detectable post. So overall, 50% uh, of patients were positive MRD peri-transplant pre-randomization. And again, this is similar to the slide I showed with quantum first. First, does MRD predict for worse survival? Yes, it does, shown here. Well, uh, um, so that just validates the assay, irrespective of treatment arm. But when you look at the effect of gilteritinib, the patients who were MRD positive clearly benefited from gilteritinib. Really no effect uh, in patients who were MRD negative. And so we've just identified the half of the patients who truly need gilteritinib post-transplant by MRD. Now, another question that comes up with MRD and transplant, maybe you can overcome all those problems by using a myeloablative condition. Use more chemo. Okay. So myeloablation here led to improved overall outcomes in the study irrespective of treatment arm, but that's not surprising. Patients getting myeloablative condition usually are younger and more fit. That doesn't surprise us. 
But interestingly, it didn't matter if you were MRD positive or negative, myeloablation still was better than reduced intensity conditioning. So there was that. Now asking the question kind of on its head, does myeloablative conditioning erase the bad effect of MRD? No, it doesn't, shown here. If you're MRD positive, even if you receive myeloablative conditioning, you do worse. Okay, so what about giltaritinib in this setting of myeloablative conditioning? Well, if you're MRD positive and you got myeloablative conditioning, you clearly still benefit from the addition of giltaritinib, whereas in the, the lower right there, not so much if you're MRD negative. So again, MRD predicts who needs giltaritinib post-transplant. Now, this assay, this MRD assay that I've shown you is something that we think is going to be used to guide management of patients going forward. Here's a couple of patients on the study. The patient on the left is on placebo, and you have two clones, a red clone and a, a blue clone, different sizes, and they're both present prior to transplant. The patient undergoes transplant, and the, and the 63 base pair clone in blue disappears after transplant. The red one is still present. Remember, this patient is on placebo. And at six months, you can see the clone is still detectable and rising. And by nine months post-transplant, they relapse. So you could imagine recognizing, identifying this and intervening either with the addition of an inhibitor or uh, DLI or something. Over on the right, the patient who's randomized to giltaritinib, yes, the clone is detectable pre-transplant, but the patient is on giltaritinib and you can see the clone wither away. And so you get this MRD eradication by giltaritinib. And this actually distinguishes the allogeneic effect from the giltaritinib effect. You get an additional 30% or something improvement in survival from giltaritinib. We think this is highlighting the potential use of this for management in all aspects of AML. So the conclusions from Morpho is while it didn't achieve its primary endpoint, this was a successful study because we learned how to use the drug clear benefit for those patients with detectable MRD pre or post transplant, and it should be the standard of care for such patients. Uh, it eradicated MRD, and we could solve that with those MRD results. Yes, in the MRD negative patients, it's a less clear benefit, and I think regional differences, which we're exploring now, probably confounded any potential benefit. You've got to watch out for the azoles because the regional differences highlighted the use of azoles and how that could impact the levels of giltaritinib and the uh, side effects, specifically neutropenia. All right, so overall conclusions for the studies I've shown you. We know induction and consolidation with quizartinib improves survival for patients with newly diagnosed FLT3 ITD AML, and that the addition of quizartinib to induction and consolidation results in lower levels of MRD which in turn leads to improved outcomes after transplant. We now have an important new tool to use in the newly diagnosed FLT3 ITD AML patient that potentially is a big improvement over mitostorin. Obviously, there's no head-to-head -head comparison, but the data look very promising. This was a higher risk population. This was a population of broader age range. So we now have some important questions as to how we're going to go ahead and incorporate this into our practice. MRD by PCR-NGS is an important new clinical tool. It is an incredibly important new clinical tool. It is currently available now in the U.S. And for patients who have MRD pre-transplant, post-transplant maintenance with giltaritinib clearly improves survival and should be the standard of care for those patients. We know that quizartinib and giltaritinib, quiz and gilt as I call them, can both cause or exacerbate myelosuppression. So you have to be aware of this, and you've got to be aware of the role of concomitant azole use in this effect. Azole use will increase the concentrations of either drug. We can use them. We can use azoles with these drugs, but you've got to be aware of that phenomenon and be prepared to interrupt or dose reduce when you're doing that. So it's an exciting time for AML, important new tools, important new drugs. We've got some decisions to make as to how we're going to use them going forward. And I'll stop there. Thanks so much. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides.